Good morning, New Eden family. Uh, it is a joy to be able to gather with you even through this digital means, through a screen. Um, we look forward to being with you all physically and present. I and mean, we're excited that this week is actually the last week for these online services. Next week, our Sinning Church Summit Crossing Limestone is going to begin physically gathering with social distancing measures in place. Um, they're going to begin gathering, so we're going to gather with them. Uh, we're asking you to attend the 5 p.m. service, if at all possible. Um, and so we're going to gather as New Eden Church there with our Sinning Church Summit Crossing Limestone for the entire month of June. And then what we're going to do, beginning in July, um, if everything works out and we're praying towards this end, we plan to gather in the city of Decatur as New Eden Church and begin Sunday gatherings then. So we're super excited about that. If you want to stay informed and see our most recent update, you can do that at newedenchurch.org. Um, and so, yeah, we're excited about that. If you want to connect with the mission God has us on, maybe you've been watching us online and you want to learn more or connect with us, we'd love to share with you information about that. The best way to do that is to text Text New Eden, that's all one word, New Eden to 97,000. That will alert us, get a little bit of information from you, and we will share with you the best ways to connect. And again, if you just want to stay informed, where we send out periodic text uh, about events or needs or missional opportunities in the city of Decatur, um, then you can text New Eden Info, again, all one word, to 97,000, and that will opt you in to receive those texts, and you can opt out at any time. So we're about to transition into worship through song. And so I'm going to invite you to read our call to worship along with me now. To all who are weary and in need of rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who celebrate and desire to share your joy. To all who have failed and desire forgiveness. To all who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To all who sin and need a savior. Our church family opens wide our arms and welcomes each of you. Just like Jesus, our King, has opened wide his arms and welcomed us into his kingdom. Let's sing together now. Good morning, New Eden Church. We're very excited that you've chosen to join us this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, seated on the throne. We're hoping that this is our last week we have to do this digitally through computer screens as we hope to be gathering in person next week. So we're going to start this morning by singing Rejoice. Would you join with us as we sing? Us. He is walking with us still. 
Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to him, he hears your voice. He will wipe away.
borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all.
my rent's own. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Our scripture text for today is Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 through 23. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I speak of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God and, our, and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Good morning, New Eden. I want to welcome both family and friends to what we hope is our uh, last virtual gathering for a while. I'm very much looking forward to getting back to seeing everybody in person. And this is also our final uh, installment in the series that we've been doing on Philippians. And if you get anything out of this sermon, that's just gravy because I have just been so incredibly nourished by God in this book and in what Joel has had to say, what Wade brought us. And um, this morning as we wrap up, I pray that uh, it ministers to you as well. The Miami Herald recently reported that the prescriptions for anti-anxiety medication have spiked 34% from February to March of 2020. COVID-19 has brought on a fear of sickness and death, uh, which has definitely played a role, but even the secondary issues of loss of income and lack of resources, uh, isolation, all those things also played a part. So how about you? Where are you? Is anything disturbing your peace? Because 
The fact that the subject of peace is just so incredibly timely in this scripture this morning. So we're going to be covering the fourth chapter of Philippians. We're going to be beginning in verse 2. I have been so reminded and maybe only just truly beginning to see how very personal this letter is. Paul is, uh, he's got it packed with practical insight and with wonderful truth, but I have really been captured by listening to someone who deeply loves the people to whom he's writing. He's a fatherly figure. He's reminding people that he loves like, people that he loves like children of how he sees reality. This letter would actually be best if it were consumed in its entirety in one sitting to really get the feel of, of Paul's love. If we read it straight through, it would probably only take me about 23 minutes. It needs to be read like a, a letter from a soldier at war where the family would gather and lean in and listen to every detail and just hang on every word. So um, as you have listened, what have you learned in the last seven weeks? Um, it kind of summarizing week one, Paul says we are partnering together in the gospel. Uh, two, he sees his imprisonment, imprisonment as Felix Culpa, basically a blessing in disguise. Um, week three was understanding that to truly be alive is to experience Jesus. And if we were to die, that's just nothing but gain. The, uh, Week five, we talked about, I mean, week four, we talked about radical unity flowing from loving humility. And in week five, we learned that work is ordained, worthy, and it is God glorifying. And then uh, in week six, we learned that all treasured things, even the good things, are nothing but manure in comparison to Jesus. And then last week, uh, Wade talked to us about running the race, running it hard. It makes total sense if what we're chasing is that prize of resurrection with Christ. Uh, throughout the whole letter, Paul's tone and message ring with joy and thankfulness. He now wraps up the letter with a reminder um, uh, that having this perspective is actually um, that he's been declaring to us it's actually what happens when we are in Christ, when we have that experience. The intent of the whole series has been to see the power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to us in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Basically, if there's no resurrection, then this is a pitiable way to live. Paul's view of everything, and I hope ours is becoming, it's got to have the backdrop of the cross of Christ. And so as we read this morning, as he says his goodbyes and reminds them of what this all means and where this means it leaves him and them, uh, we move into chapter. I want us to listen for the theme of in Christ and the peace that that reality actually brings. So let's look back at verses 2 and 3. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also look to you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. See, peace with each other happens when we agree in the Lord. It's like Wade reminded us last week, let's focus on the unity in the essential components of our faith. Let's be willing to uh, agree to hold differing opinions on debatable doctrines. And then in all of those areas, let's demonstrate and give each other love. Let us not allow anything to separate our unity except that which we believe would actually separate someone from Christ. Now we have no background on what these two women are arguing about or maybe in a disagreement over. We don't have a whole lot of context here to know how uh, heated it was. But listen to what Paul's exhorting them to do. He's not actually exhorting them to come to an agreement with each other. He literally says he's admonishing them to come into agreement with Jesus, which in turn will cause them to agree with each other and to be at the same place. And then he asked an unnamed brother to help these folks. Um, we're being called on to help folks. And from time to time, uh, when they disagree, we got to remember that when we try to help, 
the goal is to get folks to see the situation from Jesus' perspective. Not to solve it with human logical intuition or um, any sort of rules and regulations. Like the men in the Gospels that brought their lame friend to Jesus and lowered him through the roof, our job is just to pick up a corner of the blanket and haul him to Jesus. That's where the real miracles occur. In verse 4 through 7, uh, the theme is continued about peace and whether or not you actually have it. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Because these verses contain one of the most famous and regularly quoted passages in all of Scripture, I want us to pause for just a minute and really think about anxiety, really lean into what Paul's saying here. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America reports that this is the most common mental illness in the United States. It affects over 18% of our population. It's a problem without quick and easy answers. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance and medication can help. But even the secular mental health professionals agree that medicine is not the cure to the problem. It can alleviate some of the symptoms, but it does not fix it. In my experience, medicine at best can level the playing field. Dealing with the underlying issues has got to be a part of resolving the problem if we expect to ever find sustainable health. The press and the social media have spent a great deal of time uh, discussing, debating, even fighting over how much of this is real danger and how much of it is perceived. This is part of the problem. Most people believe that we can logically argue someone into or out of uh, their anxiety. I'm not sure that's the case. Sometimes that's possible, but often all we end up with is just some really loud voices. Fear and anxiety are closely related, and they cause a lot of the same emotional and physical responses. The distinction that most definitions point to is that fear comes from known or at least partially understood dangers, whereas anxiety comes from uh, unknown or maybe poorly understood dangers. But they are both can be real or imagined. If you and a friend are walking in dim light and you're headed down the path and you both see a snake, well then more than likely you have snake response. Okay, so breathing increases and heart rate goes up and your muscles tense up and adrenaline's dumping into your system. And, and then somebody pulls out, one of you pulls out a flashlight and you shine it and you realize it's a stick. And then you have stick response, which is basically all of those other responses going right back to the place they came from. And the crazy thing is you didn't decide to have snake response and you didn't decide to have stick response. The only thing that changed in this scenario is what you actually believed. The stick had been a stick all along. But the falsehood, the belief that it was a snake, was just as powerful as if it had been a real snake. Changing our belief can't always be accomplished with physical evidence or logical proof. I'm not smart enough to always arrive at the perfect answer on my own. And that's why it's such good news that we have a wonderful counselor. Now, I don't believe Paul is chastising us for our anxiety. The response is Paul describing someone who's anxious, and we all get anxious, but then coming and basically telling it to God, pouring it out right then and right there. And that's what I hope we're all going to learn to do. He talks about the uh, response that he's... Uh, exhorting us to give, and that's to make our request known to God by prayer and with supplication, with thanksgiving. But the question is, what does this look like with skin on? This is some many syllable words here. Our prayer must be brutally honest with God. Please don't tell him what you think he wants to hear. Tell him what you're actually feeling. Tell him what's underneath all this anxiety. 
Supplication means that we have to express our need, but with the confession, with the agreement with God that we can't fix it. Until we get to the end of ourselves, it's very, very difficult to accept help. Thanksgiving is only authentic when the expression is what we actually are feeling. We cannot possibly share everything that is going on in our minds. What we have to do is we have to say what is what we're really thankful for, what we actually believe. Until we see God's perspective of who we are and what the circumstances are, we are going to go on in anxiety because we're still seeing it through a very cloudy lens. We're, we're not seeing it from God's point of view yet. Peace that passes understanding is supernatural. That means it's got to be created by God. Unfortunately, I've heard these verses taught as a very simple canned remedy for anxiety. And that's a shame. I've heard people repeat, repeat these verses over and over and over, hoping that in somehow just repeating them, their feelings are actually going to change. I mean, when you think about it, this is like repeating a mantra, trying to make the warning light go off on the dashboard of your car. The wonderful counselor wants us to acknowledge the warning light. He wants us to see it and recognize it's there. And then ask him for help in finding the real problem. God does not want us to ignore it and keep driving. This would make about as much sense as putting black tape over your gas gauge so that you wouldn't worry about when you're going to run out. I think we ought to go to Psalm 62, verse 8, one of my favorites. Trust in him at all times. People, pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Now, please don't hear me say that if you just have enough faith, then you won't have any problems with anxiety. Paul just got finished telling us about his anxiety regarding Epaphroditus. And when we look in the Garden of Gethsemane at the way that Jesus struggled at night, when he was facing this understanding for the very first time ever he was going to be separated from his father, this was very real. These overwhelming feelings are often tied to very real problems for us. The only lasting solution comes to seeing your life from God's perspective. Now, that's not going to make it all pleasant, but it does make it hopeful and peaceful and freeing. Our hearts and minds must be in Christ Jesus before they can be guarded by Christ Jesus. Verses 8 and 9 add the idea of the presence of God to the theme of in Christ. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We experience the presence of the God of peace when we pay thoughtful attention to what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Only God and the things of God meet all these criteria. I don't believe this is merely a decision on our part to see the world from rose-colored glasses. God is asking us to think on the things that we actually believe about him, not just the things we wished we believed. What things do you know in your own heart and feel with your emotions are true about God. Where have you actually experienced his honor, his justice, excellence, praiseworthiness, and found that you have arrived at the destination of praise? I mean, that's what human beings do. Anytime we enjoy something, we end up at the destination of praise. I mean, you think about it. What happens when your team wins? First, your outward expressions and your inward feelings make it very obvious what's going on. And then after you've enjoyed it, you start looking around for somebody else to slap high fives with, jump up and down, scream, sometimes act really crazy. This is all an expression of you reaching the destination of praise. In 1982, I was a freshman at Auburn. And my team had lost nine consecutive seasons to the Alabama Crimson Tide. 
But I was actually in the stands that day in Legion Field in Birmingham in November when my fellow freshman Bo Jackson sailed over the Alabama defensive line and brought home that 23 to 22 victory. I mean, I reached the destination of praise. All right, me and a whole bunch of my Baptist friends, both guys and girls, charged the field to celebrate, to of course let everyone know how joyful we were, and to tear down the goalpost. Now, we had all reached the destination of praise. Have we experienced God in such a way that we got there? Do, do we find ourselves wanting to share with others who also know what it feels like? Is that what brings you into the gathering on Sunday? Do we draw those who have not experienced this into an almost jealousy of what we have? Make them want to ask questions like, how in the world do you live this way and where does this come from? Do you actually see anything in God? Do you feel that it's pure and lovely and commendable? Don't be satisfied to give the church answer. Please don't be trying to tell something you think they want to hear. God nor your brothers and sisters want you just to speak words for their benefit. We must enjoy God if we are ever authentically going to praise God. Experiencing His presence and the peace it brings comes when we sit in His lap and we agree, Daddy, this is what's in my heart and, and I, I can't fix it and I need your help. Then we get to listen to His loving, fatherly tenderness as He ministers to us right where we are. Verse 13 brings Paul's circumstances into view. Uh, verse 10 through 13 bring his circumstances into view. And 13 is probably the most often quoted. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We are content, we are at peace in our circumstances when we face the trials of life through or in Christ's strength. Please don't use verse 13 as your tagline for Christian superhero syndrome. This doesn't mean you get to go pick what it is that all things is. Listen to Paul's secret. He says he's learned that in all circumstances that God placed him in, he's been filled, he's been hungry. He's had abundance, he's suffered need. In all of that, Jesus' strength provided him the ability to both persevere and thrive. We don't decide what to do and then claim we can do it because we can do all things in Christ. We are obedient to what Christ has planned. And then we rest assured that he will provide the strength for the, where he has placed us. Our job is to trust him and to be obedient. Everything else is on God. We human beings get in serious trouble when we get into the outcome side of things, when we start feeling like that's on us, trust and obey, everything else is God's. In verses 14 through 20, I want to draw special attention to verse 19. It says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We meet the needs of others and we have our own needs met according to God's riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is an amazing truth. God doesn't meet our needs in accordance with the severity of the need. He doesn't meet our needs according to the value or the behavior of the one in need. He doesn't meet needs on anything that's finite. I mean, listen, he meets our needs in accordance with his riches in glory. And what's our theme today? In Christ Jesus. 
Think how peaceful it is when you know that your needs are met. Now, we generally tend to think of physical needs, but this is all needs. Physical, emotional, spiritual, relational. When those needs are all met, then it makes it so much easier for us to focus on meeting the needs of others. The anchor I want us to hold on to is confidence in the person responsible, not the logistics. Knowing how my needs will be met is far less important than believing the one who guarantees to meet them. Verse 21 points to Paul's admonition that we're to greet each other in Christ Jesus. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. Our initial interactions with brothers and sisters are to be in Christ. I hope it's becoming clear that basically it doesn't matter how small something is. We are to do it in Christ. What would it look like if our first encounter with anyone was from the perspective of how Christ sees them rather than our conclusions or our judgments. What would it change in our interactions if age and color and gender, dress, social class, political leanings, intelligence, nationality, all that were secondary and subject to the person's value and identity in Christ? Verse 22 is a reminder of Paul's Felix culpa, all right? All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So in prison, in Christ, resulted in those with no access to God coming into the gospel family. I mean, where would those in Caesar's household have gained access to the gospel if Jesus had put a not-so-secret agent right in their midst? And keep in mind, they invited him in. The Romans actually thought it was their idea. Paul is so honest during his time in there that the entire Roman guard realizes he is in this prison because he is in Christ. His chains are actually the representation of how enslaved he is to Christ. Verse 23 leaves the Philippians and us in the blessing that Paul prays over us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Gosh, how could we not experience peace when the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with our spirit? His amazing grace caused me to be chosen. It led me out of blindness, ushered me into his light. It's sanctifying me. It's going to complete all the work he started in me. It's going to glorify me. And then it's going to meet my needs forever in eternity with him. If I believe these things, peace will flood me. When I find something missing in my peace, I have learned not to pursue peace. Instead, I pursue the Prince of Peace. The Spirit is sounding a loving exhortation to us to pursue Christ. We are not to pursue the gifts of the Spirit. We are to pursue the Giver and find that the gifts just overflow. We are in Christ because of his resurrection. Everything else in life springs from his resurrection power flowing through us. Worst case for me today, based on worldly logic, is if I die. Here's the crazy thing, Ian. With resurrection in view, that's the best case for me today. If I am in Christ and I'm fully experiencing that reality, I will be at peace in a way that I can't even explain. If that's not what it's like for a Christian, then you're being impeded on something that is rightfully yours. God's given us an open invitation to come boldly into his throne room and receive from him that which gives us peace, his perspective. Peace is only found in Jesus. If you've reached the destination of praise, well, then enjoy the experience. But if that's not where you are, then stop pretending. Be honest about where you are. Confess, agree with God about where you are and what you feel like you have. Tell him that you need him to renew your mind and transform you. Confess, agree with him that you can't do it. 
Be unwilling to fake it any longer. Don't accept anything less than a peace that passes all understanding. And if you're not in Christ, then sustainable peace is not attainable for you. You can chase it through a lot of other means, and you're guaranteed to find empty, broken promises. You'll find your existence is exhausting, burdensome, and inevitably unsatisfying as peace constantly eludes you. Now that's the bad news. Everybody's reality is that we must find peace with God before we can find peace from God. The good news is that God didn't leave us hopeless. The peace giver wants you to be in him and he desires to be in you. Confess to God that you are incapable of supplying your own needs. Stop the struggle. Confess the rebellion. Ask God to remove this spiritual blindness. And when you see Jesus for who he is, surrender. Tell him you want to follow him. In Christ, you will receive authentic, sustainable peace with God. And as you follow, he'll supply peace in your own spirit. As we move into a time of prayer, I want to give you three prayer directives. Examine your heart right now and agree with God about where you are in Christ. Just as brutally honest as you can possibly state it. Tell him what's going on inside. And then ask the Lord to pour out his peace in Decatur and beyond through New Eden. He says he's going to build his kingdom through the church. I want to see him do that in us. I want to see him do that in churches all around Decatur. I want to look back years from now and say, look what God did. And then, thank God for everything we've learned in Philippians, but mainly for the fact that resurrection power is what he supplies in Jesus. That is good news. We take communion every week here at New Eden. And like I said earlier, I am sure looking forward to being able to take it in face-to-face -face presence. But today, this one last virtual time, let's look at what 1 Corinthians, what Paul tells them as he describes what it is that communion means to us. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
poverty, no riches. Give me just the sustenance I need. Lest I become rich, I would forget you. Lest I become poor, then I would see. Just your sovereign hands, you got me. Give me strength to walk where you will be. Let me rest beneath your strong protection. You are my provision and my As a beggar to 